Okay, recording. Cool. All right, um, so uh, I'm gonna use some slides. So let me take a shot at this and see if this comes up properly. Okay, so at the moment you should see a blue rectangle. Yeah, uh, we see your whole we see your whole desktop, but yes, okay. with a with a blue with a blue terminal in the middle. Correct. <laughs> okay. All right. And then uh, how about now? Do you see the slide? Yep. yep. Okay. One slide, right? You see one slide? Yeah. Okay. Good. Good. I have too many screens, so I've I've lined them up properly. Cool. Um, so the, 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 the fancy name of this talk is called The Barbican. Um, I, I looked that up, I'm not that much of a castle aficionado, but um, mostly I'm, I'm gonna be talking about an experience I had last year uh, with an app that I was managing. And uh, it's a cloud app, I'll talk a little bit about the app and I'll talk about the types of attacks that we experienced and uh, how we dealt with some of those attacks. Um, uh, that's kind of the theme. And then we'll, uh, we'll walk through an example of how you can get started using this technology to throttle requests if you're getting spammed with too many requests. Uh, so this is a useful little tool that uh, kind of not only solves a problem, but makes you feel a little bit better as a developer and app manager. So um, it, it wins in both categories. Uh, cool. So, so the Barbican is just um, a metaphor here, but it, it's the entrance to the castle. So represents um, a squeeze point that limits traffic. And, and that's exactly what we're gonna do with this. So uh, we'll get into some of that. So here's the basic thing we're gonna talk about, case study, as I said, right? And I'll go through kind of four parts. I'll talk about the setup. Uh, what is this app and, and what does it do? And what are we concerned about here? Um, the problem, so what happened? Uh, what, what led us to have to do something in the first place? The improvement, uh, not calling it the fix, I'm calling it the improvement, and I'll talk a little bit about why. And then the new reality, what did we uh, deal with or what did we experience after we did this? Um, so feel free to interrupt me with questions, by the way, as I go. Um, the audio is not great from your end, so I won't hear you. I'll probably just keep going, but um, they'll be noted for the recording. So, um, cool. Uh, so let's get started, the setup. So where did we begin? Like, what was this app here? Um, so this is a Rails API. I mean, that's the part that we are going to focus on. That's um, what we care about for this talk. Um, not only because this is a, a Rails meetup, but because that's really where the attack happened. A um, couple of the key things that this API does, because it's, it is really part of a larger system, but it does the user authentication. So it is the, um, the entry point for the users. Um, and then it does CRUD on some objects that um, the users care about, um, things like locations, um, and then devices. We actually have physical hardware in this um, ecosystem. So this is a cloud app that manages physical hardware out there in the world. Um, okay, so a little bit more detail. What is the uh, architecture? What are we actually looking at here? So again, I said this is a Rails API. Um, the Rails API is the public facing API part of this system. So again, that's why it's where the attacks occurred. Um, on the uh, front end of this API, we have an Ember JavaScript client app. This is the main point for most users um, to interact with the API. Um, this is their user interface and where they, um, they come to manage their devices. There are also some power users that are writing scripts and interacting with the API this way as well. Um, mostly this was internal for the company, but um, from time to time we would have some clients that would also be doing this. So um, that's the front end. Sorry, question? Nope, you're good. No. Okay, cool. Uh, behind that, there is um, another cloud application. This has a private API. Um, this is sort of like the main contact point between the, the public API and, and user interface, as well as um, the devices. So we also have southbound from this cloud service. We have devices out there in the world, and they are all talking to um, this backend piece. So this part's not really that important for um, the attack or what happened because this is a private API um, because it's um, secured access. It wasn't really an issue, but just to give a kind of full picture of what's going on with this system. Um, it's also useful to think about the type of the scale of normal traffic that this system would experience, right? Because that was um, 
one of the things we really had to focus on uh, once we started to implement the solution, and I'll talk more about that later, but um, just on a basic overview here, um, the, the public API is really the entry point for users. So when we think about what type of traffic, it's things that users are doing. And when we think about the, the traffic patterns or the frequency of requests, it's, it's on a user scale. So, you know, users will typically come in and they'll, they'll make some changes, they'll view some things, there may be a number of GET requests, probably not a lot of um, posts or puts. Um, whereas uh, on the backend system, devices might be exchanging information very rapidly and so the traffic pattern is, is a little bit different. Um, but we'll talk a little bit more about that. Cool, and so these are set up um, out there in the world. Our Rails public API is running in Heroku. A um, couple of reasons this, this works great for us because um, lower traffic means lower costs from, uh, for a more managed hosting service for this server. Um, on the other hand, the, the cloud piece that handles the devices handles a ton of traffic because um, devices are checking in every few seconds instead of every once a week. So um, this is out there in an AWS, a number, number of AWS instances. So. Uh, all right, that's the lay of the land. Um, any, any questions on this application before we move forward? No, cool, okay. Uh, let's get to the problem. So what was the problem? Um, we get lots of normal requests to this public API and I just threw a couple examples up here. Um, I don't think it's anything too unusual. Um, we get requests for assets because this is um, uh, also serving up the, um, the, the user interface. So I just threw a few asset requests here. Those are some of the public ones. They'll relate in a second. Um, CSS, JavaScript images. Um, we also get lots of API requests. And I, I didn't want to go through too many examples, but lots of regular gets to fetch information, indexes, and stuff like that. Um, but we started to see some not so normal requests. Um, and I threw a few of the URLs here. Um, for the asset requests, they come out a little bit more clearly. So we would get requests for things like this, um, which would trigger errors um, and would jump out of log files pretty, pretty easily if you take a look. Um, things like uh, longer ones, so, sorry. Uh, Try to keep typos clean as I go. Okay. Um, here we go. Here we go. Uh, yeah. <laughs> they get even longer. <laughs> this this one seemed like the longest reasonable one to try to put on a slide, but um, so so this is just some examples. Um, in fact, we we suddenly started to get a ton of attacks, uh, a ton of requests um, that were meaning these kinds of bizarre um, formats. So whether it was in the URL, whether it was a parameter in the body of the request for a post or a put, um, we, we suddenly just got flooded with these types of attacks, right? So, so what, are we, what are we seeing here, right? We're, we're getting a lot of traffic, but we're also seeing some bizarre traffic. So what is, um, what is this, this user or, or group of users trying to accomplish with these bizarre requests, right? Probably a lot of you guys already know what they're trying to do. Um, but there, we saw various forms of injection attacks. And I'll kind of talk a little bit about that for those of you who aren't familiar with injection attacks. Um, so there's some requests that are designed to do a, a number of different things, right? Some of them are designed to directly access sensitive data. Um, so we saw those, those paths that were trying to hit password files. So if those are trying to directly um, hit sensitive data files that might be living on the server. Um, our, our configuration wasn't going to allow that, but they're, they're taking a shot at whatever misconfigured system we might be using. Um, they're sending requests that are trying to execute code in our server, uh, our app server's environment, right? In our case, this is Rails. So it's a Ruby Rails environment. So they might include Ruby code in some of those requests, hoping that we did something wrong and, and allow the execution of um, strings that they passed in their request. They might be trying to execute code outside of the app environment on the server, right? So we saw um, requests that contained script code, bash code, Perl code, 
um, d other different types of programming language code that just uh, all varieties of programming languages that we might have mistakenly executed. Um, they're sending requests that are trying to execute in the database environment. Um, this is probably one people hear the most about, right? SQL injection attacks. Um, so, so SQL fragments, um, strings that terminate SQL statements and then begin new malicious SQL statements um, were in there as well. And then lastly, they're sending code that's designed to be stored in the database and executed in the future when it's returned. Um, so this is, for example, JavaScript that might be executed in the browser. Um, they're trying to get code into the, into the database so when legitimate users come and pull from the database, they might get code that would execute in their browser in a secure environment. Um, so that's kind of an overview. I'm not, gonna, I'm not going too deep into SQL injection or uh, various injection attacks, but um, we saw all kinds. I mean, we, we just saw um, a flood of these different types of attacks. So who cares? We're safe, right? Uh, maybe we're safe. Uh, it's not very reassuring to, to just think, well, yeah, we're safe, but we're getting thousands of requests. Um, but, you know, we, we expect that we're safe, right? We followed some best practices. Um, so a couple of things that we can feel good about. We, we are in a secure server environment, right? In our case, we're using Heroku for this public API. Um, we can feel pretty good that the, the holes on the server should be pretty well protected. Um, and we follow best practices for our application, right? So there, there are lots of these, but just to point out a couple that um, you should know about or should be using, we're using strong parameters for our REST API. Um, so we're not doing things like um, just dumping parameters into models without um, filtering the content there. Um, we're making sure that we're, we're carefully working with the parameters that come in. So instead, we're using strong parameters, right? We're using require and permit to be sure that we restrict the, the data that comes through our API. <clears throat> um, we're also being safe when we interact with the database, right? So we're using parameterized queries. Um, probably, probably you guys have heard of this as well. So quick example, right? We're not dumping strings directly into our um, database queries and our model queries. <clears throat> so we're not throwing the email in as a template string. Um, we're not just dropping it in. <clears throat> we're using parameterized queries. So we're using the active record system for forming a, a safe query, um, such as uh, here, or using the, the question mark template in order to um, populate the query. Uh, so we, we feel pretty good. Uh, we, we feel pretty good that our application is secure. Um, but we still don't like getting flooded with so much extra traffic. Um, just to give an idea, um, remember I said that this system, even though the, the scale of the whole system is pretty large, because this system only handles user interactivity and users don't necessarily need to manage or observe their devices all the time, um, the traffic is relatively low in this part of the system. So. Um, Prior to this, or at a, at a normal rate, we would see uh, somewhere on the order of about 100 requests per minute. Um, pretty, pretty low. I mean, this wasn't a gigantic scale system. Um, and again, users, they, they set up their devices and then they, they leave them and they might check once a week or, or less frequently. Um, suddenly, though, we were getting attacked and we were getting flooded um, with about 1,000 requests a minute. Um, and so this, this jumped out to, to us as well. And this was kind of the biggest concern that um, we're really getting hit with a ton of just bizarre requests. And while we feel pretty good about the security of the system, we don't really want to allow this to continue. Um, so there is the problem, right? So what do we do? The improvement, what improvement can we make? Um, so, We'd love to shut down attacks, and, and there certainly is some things we can do in that direction. Um, we can try to uh, check the different types of requests we're getting. We can look at the script and the code and the injection attacks that are in them and try to filter those out. But it's sort of like chasing a rabbit if we keep trying to do that. Um, we'll probably be frustrated each time one comes that we didn't catch and we'll have to add a new one, um, and it's not very satisfying as a developer. So instead, we took the approach of trying to throttle the requests. 
we feel pretty good about the, the security of our system. So let's just limit the number of requests that an attacker can make, which both reduces the load on our system from this attack, because then we don't have to worry about so many requests overloading the system, slowing it down. And it reduces the, the efficacy of the attack. Um, it doesn't block it, it doesn't stop it altogether, but it reduces someone's ability to detect uh, a vulnerability if we allowed one. So what are some of the things we need to think about, right? How often does a real client need to make a request? Um, again, these are, this is user data, something like tens of requests per minute. This is per client now, not system-wide, per client is probably pretty reasonable here. Um, we, we don't need to allow um, huge numbers, right? This is reasonable. But when we see thousands of requests per minute, um, this is clearly unreasonable. None of our customers needs to be making this many requests. Um, and if they do, they, they, they need to talk to us about a premium subscription. And Ben, from, from the client, you mean the, the, Ember, the Ember app? Was that, that was the most, the consumer of the API for the most part? Or? The, yep, exactly right, the Ember app. Um, and and there, there are also, I mentioned some scripts, and I'll kind of come back to how we dealt with that at the end. Um, but mostly right here, we're thinking about the Ember app, right? What, how, what are users doing in the Ember app? How do they interact with the server? Okay, so what's that? Uh, one more question. So yeah. these requests, were they from users that have already logged in? Yes, right. So this system is publicly, uh, anyone can sign up for an account. Um, you, you, there, there's, you can create an account and, and have access for free. Um, once you want to add a physical device, you have to pay for that, but, uh, you can sign up for an account for free and see the app. So yeah, they, they created accounts, they signed in and then they went to town. Okay. So if they're submitting requests that are obviously trying to attack the system, wouldn't you just cancel their accounts? Yeah, sure. I, I, I tried that first, but <laughs> I, for every one that I canceled, five more sprung up the next night, you know? So, yeah, I mean, there, there were a couple nights that when this first happened where I stayed up and I watched accounts get created and I deleted them in the, in the console, you know, and I felt like I was, I was playing whack-a-mole, but um, I, I started to lose the game. So, and, and I got tired of staying up all night and watching it. So, yeah. Um, sure. Any other questions? Cool. Um, so what, what can we do then? We want to throttle requests. We want to, reduce the number of requests that a single client can make, right? So we can limit the number of requests that are allowed for a particular client in a particular time window, right? We, we don't want to just shut off a client altogether because it's possible that one of our real clients mistakenly just does something unusual um, and gets blocked, but we can say for a certain time window. So we can say, if you make too many requests in a minute, in 10 minutes, in an hour, in a day, uh, we're going to block you until that time window is over. Um, <clears throat> we also might want to think about doing this differently for different endpoints in our API because they have different use profiles, right? So ideally, we would like to have different throttling parameters for those different endpoints. Um, a couple examples would be performing Git requests. Um, which are done more often, especially for a user interface that's showing things like um, statistics and, you know, status of devices, things like that, um, versus post and put requests, you know, making changes or creating new models, creating new devices. Those things happen, we would expect a lot less frequently. And so we can be a little stricter about how we're throttling those. Um, another example would be different endpoints like getting, um, the index of devices, uh, maybe more traffic, but getting a token, in other words, logging into our system, um, we shouldn't see too much traffic from any one client, right? Because somebody should log in successfully and then go about their business. If they're hitting the, the token controller 10 times in even in an hour, that's probably too much. So um, those are some of the things we wanna think about. <clears throat> so. We set out to build our Barbicon, and that's the last Barbicon mention I'll, I'll do, enough of that. Um, so what do we need to do, right? What are some of the things that we need to do in order to accomplish this? We need to identify the clients. We want to throttle specifically to the clients, not the whole system, 
we don't want to say if somebody makes a hundred requests in a minute, we shut the whole system down. Um, so we want to identify those clients, right? Well, the rack request object gives us the client's IP address, comes along with the request, perfect way to identify a client um, and, and shut them down. Um, <clears throat> we also want to remember the client's request so we can track how many have they performed. Um, sim as simple as just the count of requests for this client, but remember that we'd also like to identify maybe different throttling profiles for different endpoints or different types of requests. So where do we store this? Store it in memory for the app. Um, that's, a, that's, our, that's a good start for now. That's what we can do, um, but we'll talk about some of the um, shortcomings of that when we get to that example. Um, and then we wanna be able to define these throttling parameters somewhere in our application. So we'll create an initializer where we can set up the config to define how we wanna throttle so we can tweak it. Right? Another thing that we learned as we went here is that um, we didn't know exactly what these parameters should be from the beginning. So there was a little bit of trial and error. We set up throttling parameters that were too strict and we backed them off as we ran into problems with real, uh, real use in the staging environment before we got to the production environment where we would have had some problems. Okay, so this led us to the rack attack um, gem. So this is great, it does all of the stuff that we need. Uh, it was built by Kickstarter Engineering a few years ago. Um, it's a Ruby rack middleware for throttling abusive requests, exactly what we're trying to do here. So it's really a great fit. Um, helps us to keep these anomalistic requests down and um, gives us some of the control that we're looking for in terms of having different throttling um, parameters and different throttling profiles. Uh, and it improves developer productivity and happiness. Um, I'm not making this up. This is an actual claim they make in their blog post. You can check it out. Well, you don't uh, have to stay up at night and uh, play whack-a-mole. So. Exactly, exactly. So, it, so I, I found this to be very true. Uh, it, it spoke to me and, and, it, and I verified it later on. <laughs> yep. Um, cool. Okay. So, um, so let's, uh, let's take a look. So I want to do a little bit of a, of a live demo here and see how this looks rather than showing a bunch of code uh, in a slide. Um, I'm going to do a quick setup and we will test this out and see if we can make this thing actually work. Um, so I love to try to keep it as simple as possible. So I'm gonna create an app from scratch really quick and see if we can get this to work. This font is probably pretty small here, right? I'm now realizing as I'm doing this. Yeah, yeah, you can bump it up a little bit. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Which I used to know how to do, let me see. Command plus should do it. Yeah, here we go. Now I gotta make. Oh yeah, you gotta make the window a little bit smaller. There you go. Okay. I tried to color code my terminal with the, uh, with the talk, but it might be a little obnoxious. We'll see if it works. Oh, that's mm -hmm. fine. <laughs> okay, there we go. So let's create an application. And I'm gonna call this application sitting duck. How's that font size? Can you guys make out what's happening or should I make it bigger? It's, it's, okay. it's fine, yeah. Okay, cool. Okay, so a new Rails application, um, check it out here, and we'll keep this uh, repo going as we go. Uh, uh, let's close that. Okay, cool. So um, basic setup is started here. We've got our, um, we've got our initial application. Um, and let's also get this set up on GitHub um, because then I can share this with everybody when we're done if anybody's interested in seeing how this looks. Um, so keep my windows straight here and I'll just do this also. Um, create a new, new repository, sitting duck, okay, great. And I'm not gonna add anything else. So I'll create this repository. Feel free to stop me with any questions. Again, I don't know what experience level you guys all are at, so I can just fly through this or I can talk a little bit about what I'm doing um, if anybody's got any questions. Uh, okay, and I'm gonna add this repo here and 
on the terminal again. Okay, so we've got a Rails application and we've got it uh, set up on GitHub. That is looking good so far. Okay, cool. Um, let's also create a Heroku app for this so we can test it out. Um, <clears throat> so uh, let's see here. Uh, uh, do this with Git, database, uh, Postgres, um, and create sitting duck. No, uh, forgot the database argument. Uh, anybody off the top of their head? What's that? Uh, the, I can only hear Mike in this in the audio there. <laughs> they said the uh, equal sign. Yeah, the equal sign. Really? Yeah. Oh, it's just space. Possibly. No. Uh, let me see. Stand by. <laughs> Oh, I just have to, I just have to turn it around. I had it right the first time, but. Oh, no, I'm sorry. I'm trying to create this Heroku app with the database. I wanted to create the Rails app with the database. Uh, that's where I screwed up. Okay, we'll fix it. Okay, let's try this again. Uh, Okay. Um, <clears throat> uh, trying to be clever with the generator instead of doing this manually, so it goes quicker. But if I screw it up, it's just going to take longer, I guess. So. Um, in any event. Uh, okay, so let's get my Git repository back here. Uh, you have to make your Okay, I think we're back on track. So uh, I want a Heroku app now. Uh, let's see if I get lucky. No, of course not. So we'll do <laughs> sitting duck talk. Okay, we're, uh, we're, we're back on track. So we've got our Heroku app here. Um, let's get a couple basic things set up. We're just gonna try to get the minimum so we can get this up and running and we can hit this with a bunch of requests and see if we can do some throttling here. Um, so let's take a look at the app we've got so far. Um, see if we can pull this up. What are some of the minimum basics you guys think we need for a Heroku deployment and test? What are the, what are the things you can't push an app to Heroku without because it bothers you too much? Anybody, nobody's so opinionated that they have to have something before they push? <laughs> That's okay. Then I'll, I'll just put a couple things that, that I wanna make sure we have here. Um, 
So uh, let's see, let's see. Um, <clears throat> here we go. I'm going to create a proc file so Heroku doesn't complain to me. Um, yes. Okay. And we'll just set up Puma. <clears throat> uh, I'm going to open my gem file uh, and I'm going to give it a Rails version so it doesn't complain about that. A Ruby version, sorry. Um, so it doesn't complain about that. Um, incidentally, if you're trying to follow along, I, I dropped all these commands in the slide, so uh, I'll share that afterwards um, if, if you're interested in some of these basic steps. Um, okay, cool. So uh, we've got this basics here. Let's see. Where are we? And I would normally follow a little bit better commit practice, <laughs> but for, for time's sake here, um, uh, we'll just say, we'll keep this simple. Um, so, okay, we'll get this up on GitHub. And let's try to throw this up on Heroku. Uh, okay, so while that's um, moving along, we uh, will assume that that all goes according to plan. And let's take a look at uh, some next steps, right? We want a basic controller so we can whack at it with uh, too many requests and see if we can slow those down. Um, so let's set up a controller. Um, we'll set up a ducks controller because this is called sitting duck. It doesn't mean anything, but it's something that we can hit. Um, and we'll give it um, index and create just so we have two different actions that we can attempt here. Okay, um, good, good. Let's take a look at uh, our editor again. So uh, we've got our app, we've got controllers. Um, <clears throat> maybe, let me try to refresh this. What did the command say? Uh, yeah. I, uh, hold on one second here. I've, I've had problems with opening up the same named app in this. And so uh, I'm going to take one more shot at this. Um, The editor does not want to find it. Can you ls it? Yeah. Um, ah, I believe the screen probably created it in the wrong directory. <laughs> it's an old preloader. Well, this is new. Can you kill spring and re restart it? Yeah, that one's fine. This is something that's in my stack on the table because of spring. Yeah. Yeah. We, they're yeah. recommending killing spring and restarting it. Hmm. From Killing spring from, from what? Yeah, the, yeah, the, 
should, the PID was listed earlier. So if you scroll up, you should see the PID. You just do kill and then the PID, and that should fix it. 16, 9, Are you 8, on the same? Uh, are you in the same window? Are you in the same console? I was, I don't know, this is the other one. Yeah. Good. No, this is the only console I've left open. Okay. Where, where, I'm missing it. You see it? It was, it was in the other one. Yeah, it was in the other one. Um, oh, oh, okay. It should have. It should list free at the top um, when you did the generate, right? It was testing earlier. Oh, okay. Yeah, it was in the other one. Okay, I think I killed it. Let's give this one more try. Uh. Worked okay. <laughs> I, I I have not run into that before. Yeah. Uh, well, thanks. Kill spring. All right. Um, uh, okay. Excellent. Um, whoa. Okay. So let's see if we can get this up again. We actually have a controller now. <clears throat> Okay, so just a couple of basics. Um, let's check out our routes here. Uh, so we got some basics. I'm going to change this to resource. Um, uh, just so we have a similar example, we got our ducks. And we've got a couple actions here. Okay, pretty good. All right. So we've, we've got enough basics here to, to run our server and to hit it with some requests, right? So let's try that. Um, we'll start up a server. And we'll use, uh, we'll use Postman so that it's pretty simple here. We'll hit our server and we get the basic default um, you know, scaffolding view of our ducks index. So that's really all we need to test this out. We can hit it with a request. We can see that we've got a 200 successful return, exactly what we would expect. Um, and we can hit it with a bunch of requests in a row. Server doesn't complain. I can click, click, click. Uh, and we, we get a uh, response each time, right? So kind of simulating some, some quick requests there. So this is our setup. Now we can try to throttle requests and see if we can affect the way that this works. So, um, Let's add rack attack. Just a couple basic things to do for rack attack. We're going to add the gem and we're going to add the, the middleware um, to our app config. So let's make those two changes real quick. So back to our gem file, um, we're going to add the rack attack gem. So gem rack attack. We won't worry about versions right now, keeping it really simple. Um, let's install those. <clears throat> and uh, let's add to our uh, the rack attack middleware. So uh, our application config. Um, we're going to add our rack attack. Uh, uh, sorry, wrong thing. Uh, config middleware. We want to use rack attack. So, so two basic settings uh, activate rack attack for us. Remember, we also want to configure the way rack attack works, though. Um, so we want to have an initializer that will um, allow us to configure different throttling profiles for different uses here. Um, so we'll go to our initializers and add a new one. <clears throat> Config initializers. Uh, ben, can you? Yep. Uh, command plus to make that a little bit bigger. Yeah, let me do that first. Here. Command plus is not the shortcut. Let me go to the quickly here. Pinch zoom works on the touchpad. Pinch zoom. Pinch zoom. Pinch zoom. 
the touchpad. Uh, uh, I don't think that works either. Oh, maybe, oh, maybe because, hold on, because I have the settings open. Oh, it does. There we go. Oh. <laughs> Look at that. All right. Um, is that big enough? Yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Okay. Awesome. Um, and then I'm going to add my new file, my new initializer. Uh, rack attack dot RB. <clears throat> so to get started with rack attack, I'm going to use an example one that they provide. Um, an example configuration. Um, again, you can find this. I'll, I'll um, include this and I'll include a link to it. Um, and we'll look at some specific config here. So I'm just dropping in their example config, but we're going to take a close look at some of these parameters right here as we go. So Rack Attack actually does a few different things besides throttling. Um, it, it allows you to track requests. Um, it allows you to plug in some other functionality like um, identifying data center IPs. I'm not going to get into all that in this talk, but there's, you can read about some of the other things you can do with it. I'm just going to focus on throttling here. And so let's take a look at one of the throttle commands here. Um, oh, last thing I want to do here is, um, <clears throat> sorry, before we get to the throttling, is to activate the, the caching here. Um, we'll talk about how you, you probably want to use a more advanced setup, but we're just going to use the basic um, caching for right now for our test. Um, okay, so let's, let's look at, and I'll zoom right in here. Let's look at one of the throttle commands to see how we can actually perform throttling. So here in the rack attack config, the throttle command is, um, is, is the key to setting up these throttling profiles for how we want to limit traffic. This is a pretty reasonable one, maybe for uh, a production server, but we're not going to sit around while I click send 300 times. So uh, we're going to set up a pretty restricted one so that we can test this out, right? So we can set up a throttle with a name and we can specify a limit and a time period. Those are our key attributes to the throttling profile. So instead of 300 requests, I'm going to bring this down to just three requests. Um, I'm going to allow three requests that match this, um, this statement, any more than that are going to get throttled. Um, and I'm going to specify the period of time, right? So that's the, any, that number of requests within that period of time will block somebody for the remainder of that period of time. Um, I'm just going to bring that down to one minute for right now so we can test this out. Uh, okay. Now in the throttle um, method body here, um, I'm going to remove this for now just to keep it really simple. Um, I, I can have some more logic to decide if I want to throttle this request or not. Um, but for the first initial example, I'm not going to do anything ex extra. I'm just going to return the IP address from the request, right? So I'm going to tag that IP as what I'm throttling this, identifying this client on. Um, and it's a value that then can get counted in memory so I can track if I have more requests than allowed in this time period. All right, so pretty simple setup here for right now. Um, so I've got my, um, my main pieces. Let's see if we were successful here. So um, I'll start my server up again. Let's go back to uh, Postman and uh, let's see. Okay, one request was successful two, three requests were successful. But on my fourth request, I got a 429 too many requests. So already I've been throttled here. Um, we'll, we'll watch the clock <laughs> and uh, come back here in a minute and see if we can get, get back in. Um, but while we're doing that, let's talk about just a few more things that we can do here. Um, so I took this example away, right? Um, but uh, we can also have some additional logic in here to, to work with the, the other parameters of the request object. Um, so this example, I might say, unless the request path starts with um, a certain base path, right? So if it's coming from the assets path, I might allow, I might not be throttling it. Um, maybe there's no controller here. There are really no attack vectors here. So I'm going to allow unthrottled access to the assets. Um, but not to some of my other, my other um, 
mm -hmm. endpoints on the on the controller. I have a question. Yeah. Um, so what is the use case for why you would want to allow the assets to be throttled? Um, because I might have a, a client application that loads a ton of assets, right? Might be more than the throttle that I want to, I want to clamp down. So if I want to say, I'm not going to allow more than 10 requests per minute, but my client app, you know, every time it's brought up loads 20 images, um, I'm already going to exceed that. Uh, I got you. Yeah. So, uh, and that's, a, those are pretty small numbers and simple, but you can easily imagine, you know, at a client app loading hundred, a hundred images and getting ahead of um, the, the throttle limit. Yep. Uh, let's see. I think that's been about a minute. Let's see if we can get back in here. So one more now we're, we're unblocked and we're allowed to proceed. Um, okay. Let's, um, let's add another throttle here. and set up uh, two different profiles. So my first one was pretty restricted. Let's open this back up. So I'm gonna say, I'm gonna allow 10 um, in a period of one minute. That's, um, and, and it's, but it's just gonna throttle everything, right? 10 in a minute is, is the, I'm gonna shut you down no matter what you're doing. But I wanna set up a more restrictive profile. Maybe I'll leave it at my three per minute um, under certain conditions. And so, um, if the, let's say if the request is anything other than a get, right? So if it's a post or a put, it's, it's containing request body, it's a little bit more dangerous. Um, I, I, I don't want to allow so many of those. So I can say unless request.get, um, then this is going to get throttled, right? So, so what happens here? Um, I'm throttling at, at a, a rate of restricting to 10 per minute for all requests. But for non-get requests, I'm throttling to three per minute. Um, so let's uh, let's see if that you is working. You need to name them differently. Uh, yeah, I guess I do. Right, thanks. Before I run into that problem. Um, or was that was that part of a was that a learning step? <laughs> that, yeah, exactly. Yeah, you, but <laughs> well, fine. We'll skip ahead. Um, yeah, it was a learning step. Sure. Uh, okay. So let's see if, if this, um, if this works here. Uh, so, okay. We'll send, we can still send a get. Let's try to send a post. Um, oh, did I set this up to be uh, blocked here? CSRF. Oh yeah. Okay. Um, uh, I can. Is it in your application controller? There you go. Okay. So, uh, okay, so I did one get and one post. Let's do a few gets and see that I'm allowed to do more than three, right? So let's do one, two, three, four, five. Looks fine, I was able to do five, okay. Um, now let's do a few more posts and see if I can hit that limit. So one, two, I'd already done one from before, so that's my, that's my too many, so I hit my 429, too many requests. Um, but if I go back to my get, I should be able to do one more get without getting blocked. So now I've got two throttling profiles um, for two different types of requests, in this case, based on the, the method. Um, but I could do things based on the path or based on other attributes of the request object that I want to, uh, to control. Ben, we got a question. Can you, can you go back to your code and can you explain uh, the two different, how the, how the two interact with each other one more time? Yeah, sure. So they don't really interact with each other. Um, we check each one of these and create and, and so think of it as a, as a check on the, the request, right? And any one of these can, can match. So I can set up as many of these different profiles as I want and they'll all be checked. So all the throttles are ORed, is that right? Yes, right.
yeah, yeah. Um, okay, so um, so let's let's so so that's kind of the basic introduction. Um, I'll re reference you guys to some information if you're interested and you want to dive into this. Um, I, I don't. I won't spend too much more time writing code and messing up some of it. But um, I think that kind of gives you the basic idea. It is pretty easy to, to bring this in. And this was a really um, basic app to begin with. You know, it's also simple to drop this into your existing app and kind of trial and error, see how it works with your, um, with your use cases. So let me, uh, let me bring the slides back up. I guess got two more and we'll just kind of finish up. So the last section was the new reality. So what did this do for us and what did we, um, what did we find afterwards? So, I, so what did we accomplish? we reduce the ability for the attacker to detect injection vulnerabilities, right? It's key to note here that we haven't prevented injection attacks. We haven't stopped requests from getting through. We don't want to do that. Um, but we've limited the number of requests to try to prevent unreasonable numbers of requests. What did we observe after doing this, right? Well, what, one interesting observation that we, we didn't maybe think about beforehand was that some of our bad decisions elsewhere sort of came to light. Some of our bad API architecture and bad script architecture showed up after we did this because we ended up blocking some of the things that we were actually doing. Um, most of the scripts running against the public API, as I mentioned, were, were coming internally from, from employees of the company. Um, and we had sort of band-aided together some things. So we had scripts that would go through lists of users or lists of customers and hit each one. And those lists grew over time to the point where we had scripts that would run through hundreds, you know, or a thousand objects on the system and make a separate request for each one. Not good design, uh, either from the API in, in that being the only way to handle things or from the script and that being the way that we, we work. So we, we sort of inadvertently shut down our, our bad architecture decisions. Um, and we just had to fix them, right? So we had to not allow, we weren't allowing any more of these serial um, accesses. We needed better API design and better script design. So we needed, in, this, in these cases, batch jobs, um, which improved really our scripts. It, in, it also reduced the load on the system from things that we were running on, on crons and stuff like that. Um, so it kind of improved our system. Uh, all right, and that's basically it. That's the introduction. Um, thanks everybody. Awesome. Thanks for the, uh, the, the help. <laughs> yeah. Cool. Cool. Uh, any other questions? Yeah, I got a quick one. So what did your actual, <clears throat> what did your, um, what did that file look like by the time you're done? Was it pretty complex or were it like it, know, it, the throttles and, and the rest of the config? It, it wasn't, it wasn't too bad. So, so one of the things that I did have was, um, I had sort of a back off throttle system. I, I, I didn't really talk about that, but um, because I, I couldn't, I wanted to address sort of the number of reasonable requests in a short amount of time, like, like a five minute window, and also the number of requests over a longer amount of time, like an hour. Um, I had multiple throttle checks with, with um, sort of back off time limits. Um, I forget how many I ended up with, I think about four or five of those. Um, to create brackets there. Um, <clears throat> the logic inside of each throttle wasn't too, you didn't, you didn't get too complex, like, you know. I, I didn't dig down too much into the paths or, or you know, I, I addressing what they were accessing. Um, a couple of the things that I did hit was um, had a much stricter throttle on the tokens controller. So for users trying to log in. Um, I also did, I alluded to, but I, I did it um, include protection against requests coming from data centers because um, for this public API, there was really no reason to allow that. Um, we, we blew up one of our legacy apps when I did that, but we, that was another thing that we really needed to just move forward and fix. So we did that as well. Right. Um, uh, and uh, that was pretty much it. Yeah, it didn't, it didn't get too overly complicated. Because all these uh, requests were authenticated, would it be better to throttle based on the client's identifier as opposed to their IP address? Because IP addresses, multiple clients have the same IP address, requests be coming from different IP addresses for the same client. 
True. That's a good point. Uh, I, probably that would be better um, because we, you're right, we could improve some accuracy there. Um, I think that that there were other things to do. And once this sort of reached an acceptable level of protection, we moved on to other things. Um, but yeah, that, that would be better. And if, and if we be, be right, because I, I think you just kind of mentioned it, but we, we could, we could be more accurate that way about addressing this particular client, but we also risk blocking multiple, do you say multiple clients coming from behind the same IP, right? Um, yeah. and, and that could be a problem too. So fortunately, we didn't run into any of that, but if we would, we, yeah, we would have to come back and address it. You said acceptable level. What was that number like? You, you said you were talking from like 100 to 1,000 when it was unacceptable, but then you brought it back down to the system once you get it to where you're like, okay, now we're comfortable with it. It, it, the, the system stabilized back down near, near the 100 requests per minute mark and it's hard to say if the attackers lost interest and moved on or if we were so super successful that um we shut everything down yeah. um i don't really know the answer to that partly because I, I i don't know the answer and also because i don't have i didn't have time like i i guess that this was the kind of thing that really annoyed me when i first saw it i, I probably put a little too a little more time in than than maybe it, i had but then as you know as it moved on i i had to to give it up um I wish I had graphs and, and like charts over the, over a year of studying it, but I just, I don't, unfortunately. What, what systems were using uh, to identify that you have the, that you have the problem? Um, just your logger and. The first place I saw it was Bugsnag. So the, um, the, the thousands of requests, the first night that triggered must have triggered hundreds of bug snags because they like, they, right. they were they were dumping things in, into um, fields in in post and put requests that were breaking validations on models and things like that. So, so bug snag is where I saw it first, and then I started paying attention to the logs after that. Yeah. Uh, did these requests come through Google Analytics at all, or is it? Sorry, I did. Uh, did they come through Analytics? Google. Do they come through Google Analytics? I'm I'm assuming you're asking because there's a there's a well known bot or some kind of hack that I've seen that one. Yeah. No, no, I, I'm not, not that I'm aware of. I tracked some of the IP addresses. They just came from servers in like, um, I think one was in the Ukraine. One was, it, it, I tracked it enough to realize I was going to stop tracking it because I was, <laughs> wasn't, wasn't telling me anything interesting. Yeah. Uh, what, do you, what is your uh, advice for like another way to identify if it's happening or not? Uh, I don't use, I think that you, you want some way to keep track of, of errors that your app is, is throwing. So there, there's a number of ways to do that, right? Bug snag is one way you might pay a little more for, um, you know, um, you, you can have a, an email notification or you can have filters set up on your logger. Um, but I think that's where this jumped out. Um, I mean, that's, that's kind of the simple way to do it. Um, if you, if you want to, take this a step up, you could have some sort of survey of your, your requests. Um, but that's, that takes a little more time. Not everybody's for a simple app is going to be able to put that kind of time into it. Okay. Thanks. Sure. Did you confirm whether or not this, I'm pretty sure it's still here, but this doesn't necessarily prevent any sort of DDoS attack in the long run, right? It's still hitting your server, so somebody with enough volume is, can still overrun rack and rack. Yeah, rack itself. It's still it's yep. still rack. It's it's hitting rack, but not rails. So it's it, it's you're you're right, right? Could have run rack, but not. I think I think. <laughs> yeah, 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 for sure. I have one last question. For yeah, sure, sure. Um, uh, do you think there was anything uh, like? Uh, why do you think someone uh, attacked your website? Or do you think this is just common amongst anyone who has a sign up form or? So, so I guess, I guess there's a part B to the story. Um, and I still don't have the whole answer, but I'll tell you what, I, what I know and what I, what I suspect. So we, um, this is all, this is all that I knew at the time. And we, we set this up to prevent these attacks. 
um, as I sort of dug into some of the, the cues that I was seeing in, in the attacks, um, I, was, I started to wonder if the attacker was actually a, an attacker or was sort of researching our system looking for vulnerabilities that they, might, um, that they might tell us about or maybe try to profit from by telling us. Um, later on, I actually got some of these submitted through, this system supported access for multiple vendors, not just our company. And later on, I got some of these, um, I got some submissions through the, the vendor who we were supporting um, from somebody I suspected was one of these attackers. So, so the, again, I, I don't have proof of this, um, but what I suspect is that the, this person was using Using, they were obviously using software to send these requests because they were sending way more than a person could send. And they were doing a sort of security audit um, looking for holes. Um, but uh, I, I never really verified that. So um, that's, that's kind of about as much as I know. I'd if I ever find out more, I'd, I'd love to know the answer. But um, yeah, I mean, uh, the way I'm thinking about it is do you think that there was some a level of degree of someone handpicked your website, or are there ways that people just kind of have these giant logs of websites that exist on the internet and they just do it that way? I, I suspected it was handpicked um, because it sort of coincided with the, the kind of major release and scale up of this particular application. Um, so I don't think it was totally random. Um, I also, because they had to create a user account, so it wasn't, it, it wasn't totally automated, right? They had to, they had to create a user account, um, and then get a token. And then they probably dumped that information into this, um, their system and press start some of the requests. Yeah. I don't know if barraging is the verb, but. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Um, we should probably, uh, Ben's on the East Coast, so we should probably let him go to bed. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> he looks tired. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. 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 Awesome, Ben. Yeah. I'll get around to that eventually. Yeah. 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 Well, um, we'll, yeah. We'll yeah. Thanks, guys. Uh, I think the internet is, is telling oh, us. You, sorry, Mike, you broke up there. Yeah, yeah, the internet's telling us it's it's time to time to yeah. leave. <laughs>